Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. It is Tuesday once again, THTPodcast.com. You can stream us live at Mixler.com slash THTPodcast. We have a special guest today, former IWA and CZW Tournament of Death winner, former CZW champion. He's worked everywhere from the Texas Indies to the Northeast. He's had many, many tours in Japan. He's worked in the Europe area. Ladies and gentlemen, we have none other than, in all capital letters, Masada. How's it going, man? How's it going good? Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, absolutely. How do you like that intro, man? <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> That's an elephant intro, huh? Well, for, first, first of all, cool, first, man. absolutely. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but you uh, you trained with Paul London. You weren't trained by him, but uh, you guys were both getting trained in uh, Texas. Uh, do you still keep in touch with him at all? Uh, yeah, I do. Actually, I see Paul every month at ACW in Austin and any hockey championship wrestling. Nice, nice. Yeah. You got any upcoming shows coming up there in Texas? Uh, I just did RCW, River City Wrestling in San Antonio, and I have ACW coming up this Sunday. So I'm sure I'll see Paul there again. There you go, man. Um, and, and you were actually in, in Ring of Honor for quite some time in the early days. Um, you worked with guys like Alex Shelley, Trent Acid, um, Jimmy Jacobs, uh, Jack Evans, from what I remember, Roderick Strong actually came a little bit after you. And uh, you were also around guys like Homicide. Um, who were some of the favorite guys that you work with in, in uh, Ring of Honor and, and maybe some of the people that you didn't particularly take a liking to? Uh, man, that's so long ago. Um, I'd say for the most part, I enjoy working with everybody. But there's some people that you know that always like, play like the little game, like, oh, I'm, I'm hurt, so I can't do this and I can't do that. Um, no, man, nothing off the top of my head comes off right away. <laughs> I don't have to sit back and think about it. Uh, but I actually, I did work with Roderick uh, like when he first came in. We did a six-man mayhem match in Boston. Um, I enjoyed watching, uh, working with Roderick and Jay Lethal and Trent. Really, a lot of guys, man. You know, it's like the guys that are trying to get their spots. Like, I enjoy working with them, the guys in the inner circle, but not really so much. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Another guy, Trent Acid, man. I think I think that guy he was very underrated. You know, he did a lot of the Northeast shows and stuff like that. Um, were you were you good friends yeah, with him outside of the ring? Uh, actually, I was. Yeah, I was really good friends with Trent. Like, good people, man. He told it to you straight. Like, there was no bullshit with him. Uh, that's what it seems like with you, man. That's, that's why I wanted to interview. You. It's, it's it's good. Oh yeah, I'm, I'll shoot straight with everything. <laughs> that's very I'm respectable. Not the bullshit man. lot of the body. <laughs> very respectable. Um, Ring of Honor, you had you you bumped heads with uh, Gabe Sapolsky a few times, but uh, later later down the road, you actually worked for uh, Dragon Gate, and also you did a show with uh, a couple shows with Evolve, from my understanding. I remember actually the match against AR Fox, I believe it was. Um, mm-hmm. Do you do you have any uh, plans of doing any future Evolve shows or anything like that, or is that kind of do you kind of stay away from that? Uh, I, I don't plan on doing any Dragon Gate or Evolve shows. Like I did a little run and. Gabe and I don't ever see eye to eye, and that's this stems from something from Ring of Honor, and right. we don't get along for whatever reason it's been. And I'm like, I'm not a child, man. I'm not gonna play into the bullshit games. Like March eighth, it's actually been 16 years of being a pro wrestling. So a lot of people don't know that. 16 years, and I don't have time for bullshit. <laughs> there you go, man. Yeah. Long time, long time. Um, you also did a couple matches for uh, TNA. You worked with guys like Disco Inferno. And um, did you ever deal with Conan when you were in TNA? Uh, my first match in TNA was against Conan, the singles match. And then I wrestled um, Disco Inferno and David Young. And then also wrestled three live crew, uh, Ron Killens, Conan, and then uh, uh, Road Dog, Jesse James. Nice. Nice. How was your experience in TNA? Uh, the time being, like, when I was there, I... I really didn't like it because it didn't really get any leeway of like, okay, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to work on and how to get a job here. It's almost like you're just here to, you know, do a squash match and that's it. And nobody's really giving you any advice or taking you under their wings to actually get a spot there. So on that, that level of things, I didn't really care for it because I was kind of hoping for more. Um, and I uh, noticed like the locker room is like super segregated with like so many people like, Guys that worked for ECW stayed here. WCW guys stayed here. WAF guys stayed here. And the guys that worked for all three promotions were like kind of meet with each other, but not so much. And then the independent guys just stayed there, you know, in their own little groups. I, just, I kind of got the vibe like, no one's out here to help you. It's pretty much cutthroat, and you know, that's how it is. Unfortunately, that's how wrestling is in general. 
Yeah. But that's the first time I started getting that vibe off of stuff like that. Yeah, man. From from the outside looking in, that's what it seems like. It seems like a cutthroat business. But uh, Boxman, you got a question? Uh, yeah, I want to ask about the um, what was some like what was the most stitches you've had from a match? Was it that uh, gusset plate match with Danny Havoc? Um, what's the most what? Was it that gusset? Sorry? The gusset plate match that you had with Danny Havoc? Was that uh, as match? far as like the most blood or most gruesome match? Is that what you asked? Most stitches from a match. Oh, it's most stitches. Oh, man. Actually, I'd say the most stitches I've ever gotten from a match actually was in Japan against Miyamoto. In, uh, it was Miyamoto, Jun Kasai, and I uh, forget the other person. I want to say uh, Isami. Uh, that's the match I got the most stitches. I got probably about 200 stitches. I got a bad laceration on my hip and then on my chest and on my shoulder. And unfortunately, that match never actually even aired. It was something for Spike TV. So, oh, well, wow. that's the match I've actually gotten cut up the worst. Man, that is a, that is a waste of bloodshed right that's there. That's a waste. That sucks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've never understood some things that Big Japan did for the longest times. Yeah. Wow. Now, speaking of Big Japan, you actually uh, you started Big Japan uh, kind of early in your career. Actually, before uh, many guys went over there, like you know, Madman Pondo, Necro Butcher, Too Tough Tony. Um, I know you had a good relationship mm-hmm. with uh, Too Tough Tony. What are your thoughts about uh, Madman Pondo and uh, Necro at the time? Uh, at the time, I, uh, Kevin and Pondo, I know, always got along. Uh, me and Necro did not like each other at all. He came through the tech area, and the way I looked at it back then, I lost respect for Dylan now, Necro. But um, coming up at the time, like for me, like my style was more or less like I want to be a deathmatch wrestler and actually show that I can wrestle and like put psychology in the matches. And, you know, that's what made me fall in love with that style of wrestling, like with matches like from FMW and uh, ECW. And then for me, when Necro came up, it was just like the typical, you know, garbage wrestling. I'm going to hit you with this. You hit me with this. And those so everything. And there's no story on anything or any kind of teasing. But later on, like working with him so many years, like, uh, he's like a big brother to me now. But at that time, we did not like each other. Yeah. Now, one match I would definitely love to see, which uh, probably won't happen now because of his age, but uh, I would love to see Abdul the Butcher against you and see you insert the skewers in his head. I think that's just an unforgettable sight to see. Have you ever met Abdul? Uh, <laughs> and if so, any thoughts on Abdul the Butcher? I actually have met Abdul the Butcher. Um, there was one time I was doing a show in uh, Kyoto, Japan, in uh I don't know if you're familiar who uh, Masa Hori is. Yeah. Um, he's a famous super super fan out of Japan. But we're taking a bullet train, and uh, there's me, Jun Kasai, and uh, Nikon Lee. And Masa Hori actually came up to us, like, in our different trails. And, uh, you know, do you want to meet Abdullah? And I was like, yeah, sure. And he's like, you know, meet him at the show? Or, and he's like, no, meet him right now. So I just went back there and actually met him. He was a super polite guy, a really nice guy. Yeah, definitely seems like it. I've seen some uh, interviews with him, and he, he didn't. <laughs> I didn't expect him to speak like that, but uh, yeah, you never know, I guess. Um, Boxman, you got another uh, question? One of the things with, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You, you were saying something. Uh, one, one of the things I was going to say with Abdullah, Abdul actually taught me, like, at a show, he's like, you know, anytime you do pictures or do signings, you know, make your money. Don't do anything for free. So then he's like, you know, just charge him, like, you know, 10 bucks or whatnot, and, like, you know, 1,000 yen. You'll be surprised people will pay it. Another thing is, like, if you're not charging, you know, to do this, and I am, that makes me look bad. And I was like, I completely understand that. So. <laughs> Smart mind for the business. Got some business tips from Abdullah, so he's made some money in this business. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Anyway, uh, Boxman, you got another yeah. question? I um, was going to ask about uh, last year at uh, this, the Tournament of Death, you got to work with Kasai. How was it working with him uh, back in the States again? Oh, it was awesome. Like, um, definitely brutal. I always enjoy uh, wrestling with Kasai. Um, one of the things I kind of I like that match, but I know we can do better, and that's kind of like with a tournament standpoint. Like, it's so difficult to go out and do three matches back to back, and then try to do something different each time, and I really get the time. Like, okay, well, what are we doing exactly? What's the preparation as far as like the office goes? Like, I didn't know what the finals even consist of. So that gets kind of difficult. But I always enjoy uh, fighting with Kasai. It's always good times. Yeah. 
And you were uh, you briefly mentioned uh, you know selling autographs and things of that nature. I always thought you were great at branding and, and, and selling unique merchandise. For example, like the skewers with the skull and uh, some of your bones. Uh-huh. Really, do you, do you still do the bone carving? I, I still do. I actually, uh, I'm running a business right now. It's called Exile Artifacts. And uh, I think that's what I've been doing a lot of right now. Is I do custom uh, bone art. And as you were saying before, I also like make skulls and pretty much anything you could think of. Like, I'll go ahead and, and make it. It's just completely 100% custom art and made by me. Awesome. Uh, a lot of people didn't know that I was into that type of stuff. So it helped people kind of catch it on. There you go, man. Uh, you got you got a website for that that you, that you want to plug in case anybody wants to buy some? Yeah, it, the website actually is under construction right now. It's www.exileartifacts.com. And then there's also Exile Artifacts on Facebook. So um, anybody that checks that out, you know, go see what I have. And there's tons of stuff that are constantly being put up on there. Yeah, uh, definitely. Definitely check I, it out. Definitely check it out. I, I co-signed. I was at the Tournament of Death last year. You got some cool merchandise, definitely. And his shirts as well. They're not like corny. They're not like corny ass typical wrestling shirts. They're actually something you would want to wear outside. But uh, any yeah. wrestlers that any wrestlers that had a problem with uh, taking the skewers because that seems like the most brutal thing ever. I, it's hard for me to watch it. So I'd imagine there were probably a few that uh, were kind of in, in fear of taking the skewers. Uh, the only person I've ever had a, uh, an issue with that was uh, a young kid. In San Antonio, and yeah, I guess you just assume like they just randomly do this for no reason. But we we're already working a program. And it's like, okay, well, you got your heat on me later on. I got to get something back on you. Like you know, shows down later. And he was the first person that ever told me he wasn't going to do it. And it's like, oh, I'm a veteran here in Antonio. It's not as bad as you think it's going to be. Realistically, it is. But I don't really care. You know, he was only like two years in. I was like, I'm not going to do anything just to try to get myself over. Realistically, it's going to get you over as well. So that was the only person. Uh, Sammy Guevara was like, I had an issue with him. And other than that, uh, really nobody <laughs> except for him. Man, that's, one that's, person. that's surprising, man. If I was a wrestler, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be down with that one, man. I got to tell you, that one is. <laughs> I give you credit, man. That, that looks brutal. Yeah, it does. Okay. Well, I wrestled Kevin, Kevin Steen, and actually Steen asked for it. And it's like, okay, you know, <laughs> just so <laughs> happens I have him. <laughs> now, uh, speaking of Kevin Steen, you know, of course he's in NXT, but another guy that that's in NXT that you're very familiar with is uh, Drake Younger. I'm a big fan of the guy. I think, he, you know, he's very underrated. He always put his heart and passion into the wrestling. And uh, do you still have a relationship oh, yeah. with uh, Younger, and, and how is he? How, is he is he liking NXT? Has he adapted? And what do you think about it? Uh, I think it's great for him and his family, honestly, to be in NXT. And I know he's saving body, that's for sure. Um, and Drake's, Drake's a good guy, like 100%, like, honest person, you know, good heart, and good head on his shoulders. I'm really happy for him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you could book yourself into a favorite dream match, who would it be against? Would it be against like somebody like Mr. Pogo, Atsushi Onita, Terry Fong, Carlos Colon? Who would it be? Oh, man. I'd say, like, if, if Hayabusa was still wrestling, Hayabusa would be one. Um, Terry Funk, obviously. Any of the, the old school, like, uh, deathmatch legends, like, I'd love to, to fight with them and, you know, see how that goes. There's too many people I would love to wrestle with, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, that's a really good question. Hayabusa, that would be a good one, man, because uh, him and Mike Awesome, they had some you know, phenomenal matches. And you actually, you're very underrated when it comes to your uh, agility because you, you used to do a lot of high-flying, actually. Um, and uh, I actually remember the one show, um, the, the Scramble Cage 2, uh, where you kind of try to show yeah. off uh, Teddy Hart. That, I mean, that was an awesome spot. You know, I mean, a lot of people don't know about stuff like that. But be- prior to the death match for wrestling, you were actually doing a lot of uh, – just, just regular wrestling, and you were very good at it. I think that's that's uh, that's something that people overlook when it comes to you. Yeah, I, I would kind of get like, you know, <laughs> it's like you judge a book by its cover. Uh, yeah, I used to do a lot of high flying. The Scramble Cage, I did a 450 splash off the top of that. And if you watch the Scramble matches in Ring of Honor, I used to do a lot of like, you know, Lucha style, American high flying base stuff. And then, you know, later on, I kind of changed my style up when I went to Japan and got more of an understanding, like, okay, well, if everyone else is doing this and they're the smaller guys, they need to be doing that, not you. I weighed, like, 245 at that time at 6'2", legit. And with my boots on, 6'3", doing a bunch of high flying. 
And uh, in my opinion, you know, I'm actually not that big of a guy. Is when you have guys like Shawn Michaels, well, who's definitely the same size as me. I just think the game has stepped down to where a lot of smaller guys are coming in. Which isn't a bad thing. I hope it doesn't come across that way. But for me, it's kind of normal <laughs> as far as the size wise. How much of the uh, current uh, product are you watching? Uh, uh, you know, the which, WWE TNA stuff. Any of it? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't watch any of it. Um, I'll catch the, you know bits and pieces here and there. And that's typically when I'm visiting, like, with my friend Scott Summers. And other than that, I don't, I don't follow it. I don't pay attention. I'm usually pretty busy and a lot of stuff. I just I don't really care. <laughs> yeah. You know I think the more I've, got, I've gotten into the business, so the, the less I've watched it, you know? Yeah. All right. Sorry about that, peep. I don't know what the hell happened. We, uh, we, we lost something. So whatever. We're back. All righty. Sorry, we're back Sorry, in Masada. Masada. Oh, it's okay. No problem. Appreciate it, man. Now, after after your TNA tryouts, um, you uh you got you got to work some WWE shows, including a match against Maven. Any guys around there in the backstage that uh, uh gave you any advice? Anybody that you made, that you kind of networked with? Uh, there's actually a lot of guys. Like that's kind of like the the coin flip of things. Like I said earlier, like with TNA, no one really gave you any advice. Nobody really cared. Um, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. Uh, a lot of people in WWE actually pulled me aside. Um, Michael Hayes was one of the main ones. He actually came up and told me and Maven, he's like, Maven, that's one of the best matches you've had on TV. Um, and he kind of pulled me under the wing. He's like, you know, and he goes right back to like Abdullah business standpoints of like how much money you should be charging. And since you just, you just, you're going to be on TV now. So, you know, your money profits just came up. Which, you know, they kind of did, but not really, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, he gave me a lot of advice. Uh, Chris Cannon did, uh, Bill DeMont, and as a matter of fact, even Regal did. Um, nice. There, to me, it was a complete 180. It seemed to me like with WWE, like the guys had their jobs, and, you know, we're trying to branch off and, like, bring in new blood to make money, and that's what business is really about. Yeah. Um, now you you mentioned Bill Demont and you said that he uh, he helped you out obviously so yeah he's he's in good thoughts with you um did you have any dealings with uh, with him other than that and did he act towards any of his uh, allegations that he's getting now or is that something that you don't see really happening with him? Uh, I mean the thing is like with with Bill like I did some training with him like before uh, Raw and SmackDown um, but it's not like you're at NXT and I've heard the drills and all the stuff that he does. Right. Um, I didn't experience that. Of course, we're only training for like an hour long, and then it's get straight to work. Um, so I can't really, you know, say anything about that because I've never experienced with experienced that. But I know a few people that actually have. Uh, Jacob Pliskin, Biohazard, who's from San Antonio, told me horror stories like when he was in Deep South, and uh, Bill's really tough on guys. Yeah, almost like a drill sergeant in a way. Yeah, I think that's what they actually compared him to. So. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Did you? Uh, I hear a lot of things. Even Sammy told me, he's like, basically, you know, everything that you learned on the Indies and everything that got you there, you're wrong on, and they completely break you down and reprogram you. Um, that's what he's told me that, from what he's experienced and what he's seen. Yeah, that, that definitely comes across on TV the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Um, now, beyond wrestling, did you get to see this clip with uh, Chris Dickinson and uh, Kimberly? Because this, this, this apparently offended a lot of people. And I just, I mean, it's, it is 2015 and everybody gets offended by everything. But, I mean, it's, it's wrestling. This is predetermined. These, they know what they were doing. I just want to get your thoughts on this and if, if you did see it at all. No, I haven't seen it. I don't, I don't know what that's about. Yeah, he basically, he basically gave her a stiff chair shot and, and the whole world started crying and it went on from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. And, uh, also, um, do you have any websites or anything that you'd like to plug? Any upcoming events? I actually have a wrestling school that's opening up. It's um, it's hybrid hybrid school of wrestling is going to be open up in San Antonio. Uh, the trainers, I'm one of them, and Ray Rowe from Ring of Honor and Chris Marvel. Um, everybody should know him. Like he's worked for Ring of Honor, international, like you know, independent talent. 
and Ray Rose, like I said, ROH, you know, all the way. <laughs> but we're the three trainers. We're opening up a school in April. That's something I definitely want to plug. People need to check out. Definitely. So if you if you want to get into the wrestling business, if you're in the Texas area, check him out. He's he's not going to break any light tubes over you. He's going to teach you how to wrestle. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to teach you how to lock up and take a risk. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you actually have a lot of psychology in your wrestling, you know. So, yeah, I, th- I think you'd be a, a, a great uh, a great assist with that. Oh, for sure. Thank you. Absolutely. There's a lot of training before me, so I'm better. Otherwise, I got ripped off. <laughs> there you go, man. <laughs> Uh, you know, of course, I live in Philadelphia, so I got to see you at, at CZW and then other shows a lot. Um, any chance of you coming back to the Northeast anytime soon? Uh, honestly, I have no idea. Uh, the only thing I know of is possibly uh, on point. Um, nice. And I think that's going to be sometime in June. But I just have to see how the scheduling goes because i uh, actually going to be doing Puerto Rico at some point in time. Um, like I said, that's the only thing as far as like the Northeast goes. Nice. All right, well, we're going to have Tommy Dreamer on the show in a, in a month or two. We've got to get you on House of Hardcore, man. Tag team with uh, Lance Hoyt. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I'll be down for that. That's there you right. go, man. Let's see. We've got to make this happen. But uh, anyways, man, well, I want to hold you up. appreciate you being on the show. Once again, thank you, Masada. Uh, you can check him out. you want to plug your uh, Twitter, any any Facebook, anything like that? Uh, anybody, just check me out on uh, Brigham Paul Dome, Masada. That's my Facebook. And check out Exile Artifacts. And uh, if you're on Instagram, check out Exile 1999. Um, those are the only things I have, so check them out. There you go. Support independent wrestling, and you got some cool merchandise. I, I co-signed it. People know on this show I don't I don't <laughs> bullshit and kiss ass, so it is what it is. But, hey, man, once again, appreciate you coming on the show, man. I don't want to hold you up. I uh, appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. No we got you. Do it again. Definitely. If-